Let's read together from Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6, beginning with verse 10 through to the end of the chapter. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled, and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he laboured till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king, and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. And the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought, and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Amen. Beloved, there are two major historical factors that serve as crucial background for this chapter, Daniel 6, and our text this evening, verses 19 through 28. The first of these is the immutability of the laws of the Medes and the Persians. This is mentioned several times in Daniel 6, 
some of which we read earlier. Verse 8, for instance, the word of the presidents and governors, etc., to Darius. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. The same point is made in verse 12 and verse 15, and it is reflected also in verse 17. And the immutability, the proverbial immutability of the laws of the Medes and the Persians is also mentioned and undergirds the book of Esther set in the Medo-Persian Empire. Chapter 1, verse 19, Vashti must never come before Ahasuerus again. And that's a law of the Medes and the Persians. It's not going to be changed. In Esther 8, verse 8, the Jews are allowed to defend themselves when attacked. And that's a law of the Medes and the Persians. It's not going to be revoked. The significance of these immutable Medio Persian laws in Daniel 6 ought not be lost upon us. Daniel enemy, Daniel's enemies have tricked King Darius into signing a law stating that anyone who makes a request of any god or man except through or to Darius during this period of 30 days must be punished by being cast to a den of Lions. And then Darius tries to get the law changed, but he can't. He's stuck with it. That's the first historical factor, something distinctive about Medio Persian laws, which didn't obtain with Babylonian laws or Greek laws or Roman laws. The second historical factor, this is distinctive largely too is the means of execution. In the Babylonian Empire, the burning fiery furnace was one means that was appointed and used. Jeremiah 29 verse 22 tells us that Ahab and Zedekiah were consumed by such flames at the demand of King Nebuchadnezzar. And then in Daniel 3, that was the fate that supposedly was going to await Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Burning fiery furnace. That was how the Babylonians did it. Just as later the fourth empire, Rome, would crucify people. But now here, the Medo-Persian empire did not execute people by means of fire. The number one deity of the Medo-Persian empire was Ahura Mazda, who was the god of fire. And to execute people by means of fire within that religious framework would have been sacrilegious. So they're not going to burn people alive, that is, kill them through the flames. They're going to use a different gruesome means of execution. The Medo-Persians threw people into a den of lions. And there is an ancient record which was uncovered in the, the Medo-Persian palace at Shushan, which lists 484 men of high degree who were slain by being cast to lions in a den. And Daniel's name wasn't on that list because he wasn't so slain. Two major historical factors. The law of the Medes and the Persians was immutable and the means of execution, the den of lions. About this den of lions, a little bit here as background again for our text later in Daniel 6. It had two entrances apparently. First of all, there was a side entrance into which Daniel goes in verse 16 and then a large stone was rolled over that side entrance in verse 17. And then there was an opening at the top 
According to verse 13, it sure looks like that was the way Daniel was taken out of the den of lions. He didn't go to the side entrance with the door and have that stone rolled back. Instead, he was taken up out. And verse 24 is even clearer than verse 23 regarding this opening at the top because the two other presidents and the princes and their wives and children, their families, were thrown down into the den of lions. They didn't roll back the door, roll back the stone over the door and put them in. They threw them in because the text says that before they even reached the bottom of the den, think of their descent now, the lions overpowered them and crunched their bones. All that being understood, let's consider together Daniel's deliverance from the lion's den. First, and most briefly, the troubled king. Second, the divine deliverance. And third, the royal doxology. It's especially found in verses 25 through 27. Daniel's deliverance from the lion's den. The troubled king. The divine deliverance and the royal doxology. King Darius is troubled. He's troubled when he realizes that he is trapped in the role of an unwilling executioner, if you will. As we said, he has signed into being a new law. A new crime has been created with this law. And if anyone asks a petition of any god or man for 30 days, he has transgressed. The punishment is, as we said, the perpetrator will be cast into a den of lions. A sure and certain death, one would think. But then Daniel, Darius's top man, his most trusted lieutenant, whom he's going to elevate to the highest position possible under himself, is caught committing this crime with this doom impending and the law of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed. And so Darius is listed apparently with the unwilling executioners among the royalty that are spoken of in the Bible. Herod Antipas unwillingly had John the Baptist executed because he rashly said to the girl whose lascivious dancing so pleased him that I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. She asks her mother, who is a grudge against John the Baptist, and she asks for the Baptist's head upon a platter. The king doesn't want to do it, but he doesn't want to lose face, and so that man dies. Pontius Pilate was also an unwilling executioner, so to speak, because he didn't want to have to put Jesus Christ to death because he knew he was innocent. He knew it was envy, but he was warned that he wouldn't go down in history as Caesar's friend if he allowed this man who allegedly, although Pontius Pilate knew it was hogwash, was setting himself up as some sort of a rival king to Caesar. And now Darius is caught, apparently, with the same horns of the dilemma. As we saw in a previous sermon in verse 14, Darius goes the legal route to try and save Daniel. The king, when he heard these words, that Daniel was guilty of breaking this new law, he was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The legal route didn't work, because verse 15 says, O king, know that the law of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed. So he tries what we might call a religious route in verse 16, saying to Daniel, Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, maybe he'll save you because I can't. Darius then passes that night without three things. 
without food, because he's fasting, without music, because he's sad, without sleep, because he's restless, unable to nod off, says verse 18. Next morning, he rises at the screck of dawn. He goes to the lion's den, both personally and quickly, and cries with a lamentable voice to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? In verse 16, he said, Your God will deliver you. Now it's a question. He expected to hear the roar of a girl of the lions, but actually Daniel spoke back to him. This divine deliverance of Daniel was real, complete, and miraculous. In that den were vicious and carnivorous lions man-eating and hungry lions. And verse 4, we'll read it later in a different connection, makes that very clear. There was nothing wrong with the lions. They were ordinarily, ordinary, vicious, carnivorous, man-eating, hungry lions. Daniel was put into that den of lions, not just for a few seconds or a few minutes. So one can't argue that perhaps the lions didn't notice Daniel, or perhaps that man in his 80s or 90s was really fleet of foot and managed to dodge and duke between them for a while. He was there for hours, a whole night. And Daniel 6 makes it clear too that escape was impossible. He couldn't get out through that hole at the top of the den, and the side door was shut with a heavy, and for one person, immovable stone, which was sealed. Verse 17 says, A stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now, at first, when you think of a hole in a den or a cave and the rolling of a stone across it, that's easy to understand. But the seal, how do you work a seal with signet rings? One commentator that I read said that string or ropes could have gone around that stone and then the loose ends all tied together and then wax put over it, and then the signets impressed upon the wax, so that if the stone was rolled away, that is if it goes that way or that way, it would break and the seal would therefore be ruptured. That may be the way in which the stone which covered Christ's tomb was sealed to, or perhaps a slightly different method was used. But whatever way we go with that in Daniel 6 here, Daniel could not slip out for most of the night and then sneak back in again just before the king arrived. No, the stone was immovable, and especially that stone was sealed and he did not go through it and sneak back in. To rule out all possible evasions, we should note that Daniel lacked any weapon to defend himself and that he didn't bring into that lion's den any lion-taming equipment, such as a chair that you see the guys in the zoo, or not the zoo, the circus using, and he wasn't even trained as such, this old man in his 80s or 90s. And after all these hours, in that den, 
with these ferocious lions, when Daniel was hauled out, and here one can hardly think, mention this without thinking of Jeremiah being hauled out of the dungeon in Jeremiah 38, but when Daniel was hauled out, he hadn't sustained any injuries and not even a scratch. He wasn't traumatized. He wasn't even scared. Not a single lion had so much as laid a paw upon him. And this is very similar to the description of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after their being cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Daniel 3, verse 27. The princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was even an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats or clothes changed, nor even the smell of fire had passed on them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, chapter 3, Daniel, chapter 6, completely and utterly unscathed. Despite being put into what is ordinarily a death trap. Who or what then was the divine agent who affected Daniel's deliverance? This is what the prophet confesses in verse 22. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. The word rendered angel in verse 22, sometimes in scripture refers to created angels who are sent by God as his messengers, <coughs> ministering spirits sent out for the salvation of those whom God has elected, according to Psalm 103 in Hebrews 1. And the word angel or messenger is also used in the Bible with regard to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is called, for instance, the messenger or the angel, but the messenger of the covenant. Malachi 3 verse 1. And I believe here the angel or messenger is Christ, as a number of other commentators do too. I believe it's Christ in that, first of all, it refers to the angel or messenger in the singular. There are other passages in Scripture which talk about created angels as defending God's people, and there it uses the plural. Here it's the singular. And this weighs more with me. I argue that it's a reference to Christ because of the analogy with Daniel 3. Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 are very much paralleled, just as Daniel 2 and the four kingdoms and Daniel 7 with the four beasts, which are the four kingdoms and the parallel of the four metals, are very similar. Daniel 3 verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar says, Lo, I see four men loose, not just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants. He has sent his angel, his messenger, who's like the Son of God. Singular. This leads us to another question. Was Christ here visible to Daniel? Did he see this divine messenger. And I believe that he was, just as Nebuchadnezzar saw in that fiery furnace a fourth individual, Daniel saw this messenger, the Son of God, and therefore he spoke of him. Verse 22 of Daniel 6. My God hath sent his angel, his messenger, and I know this because I've seen him, singular, if he hadn't seen anything he wouldn't have known that there was just one messenger that had been sent, 
Maybe God sent as many messengers as there were lions. My God has sent his messenger and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. And we read elsewhere in this chapter that Daniel knew that the stone which smashed the metallic colossus in chapter 2 and which became a great mountain, the king of the kingdom of God there, that was Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted. Daniel has his own dream or vision in chapter 7. One like unto the Son of Man coming before Jehovah. That was Christ. In Daniel chapter 9, he speaks of the coming of the Messiah who will deal with sin. And here I believe in Daniel 6, Daniel not only receives prophecy about Christ or interprets somebody else's dream or even sees Christ in a dream or vision but here Christ was with Daniel in the lion's den in that den Christ was Daniel's defense and deliverer his fortress and his high tower his rock and his refuge the refuge of Daniel in the den was Christ and Jesus Christ has also stopped the mouth of the devil against us. Because the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. And he defends us from the devil by dealing with our sin. Because part of God's punishment for sin is to give people up to the slavery of sin and the law and Satan in that Christ dies for our transgressions paying the price affecting our redemption before God we're liberated from the service of the devil and enter the liberty of the children of God what then was the means or instrument of Daniel's deliverance the agent was Christ the answer here is faith. Faith in the living God. Faith in him alone. Daniel 3 says. Daniel 20, verse 20, 6 verse 23 says. Daniel was taken up out of the den. Through that hole atop. And no manner of hurt was found upon him. Because he believed in his God. He believed. And we notice that this is not only what Daniel 6 says, but this is also the Holy Spirit's teaching in another place, Hebrews 11, verse 33, where we read, Through faith, Daniel stopped the mouths of lions. Daniel 6 says it, and you mightn't have noticed it before, because he believed in his God. And then the same Holy Spirit that wrote Daniel 6 through the prophet sees his earlier work and highlights the fact that it was through faith the lion's mouths were stopped. And we have another parallel here between the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in chapter 3. And of Daniel himself in chapter 6. Because to quote a little bit more of Hebrews 11. It not only says that through faith. Daniel stopped the mouths of lions. Chapter 6. But it says that through faith. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Quenched the violence of fire. And that too is mentioned in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar says, verse 28 of that chapter, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel or messenger and delivered his servants that trusted in him. And here's the author of the book of Hebrews by the inspiration of the Spirit. And he notices that Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 both say that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel trusted and believed 
and that that was the means or instrument that God used through his agent, the messenger of the covenant, to deliver them. And this is what faith does. Faith looks outside oneself because faith always realises one's own poverty and faith looks away from oneself to the living God. And faith then in looking to God receives from God salvation from sin and peace in Jesus Christ and here in Daniel 6 just as in Daniel 3 faith in its peculiar acting receives from God a miraculous deliverance from the burning fiery furnace chapter 3 and from the den of lions that's what faith does looks away from oneself to Christ and receives the benefits and blessings of the triune God this is a point made regarding faith in Hebrews 11, a chapter we looked at in a different connection this morning. Hebrews 11, on the roll call of faith, begins, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the realization, the conviction of invisible things. It's having them already. Through believing. Verse 2. By it the elders. That is. The people of olden times. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And Daniel. By it. By faith. The elders obtained. A good report. Verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe. One. That he is obviously of, and two, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Otherwise, why would you bother seeking him? And this is what Daniel 6 says in verses 10 and 11. That Daniel, even though he knew the unchangeable law of the Medes and the Persians, that Darius had unwittingly signed his death warrant, as it were, Daniel went into his house, with his windows open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, kneeling upon his knees, he prayed three times a day, giving thanks to God as aforetime, and made supplication before his God. To use the language of Hebrews 11 verse 6, he believed that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And God delivered Daniel, and God answered his prayers. Daniel 6 underscores the completeness of Daniel's deliverance in that it speaks of the destruction of his enemies. Verse 24, the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. We often think of this chapter, Daniel in the lion's den, and we can forget that he wasn't the only one who ended up in the lion's den. Them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery over them and break all their bones in pieces before they ever even reached the bottom of the den. And here justice was administered regarding Daniel. He was cast into the den of lions according to the unchangeable Medio-Persian law. He broke the law and then that sentence was carried out against him. And the law didn't actually say he had to be killed. That's supposed in the fact that he was cast to the lion's den and he was. King Darius and Daniel fulfilled the letter of the law. But he wasn't eaten by the lions. He was cast to the den of lions, but they didn't eat him. They didn't eat him, we're told. Why? Because Daniel was innocent of any crime before God or the king. As Daniel says, My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, and they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, 
God knew that I wasn't guilty of any, any crime. Of course, he was a sinner, but he didn't commit any heinous crime that deserved the death penalty at the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt or wrong? So there was justice. The letter of the law was carried out on Daniel. But he wasn't eaten because he was actually innocent. And justice was also administered now, though to a very, with a very different result, upon Daniel's enemies, as verse 24 spells out. Proverbs 11 verse 8 says, The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. And that certainly applied to Daniel. He was delivered out of trouble. And instead of Daniel, the lions got a far better meal. They didn't just get one old wizened man. They get younger people, male and female, and even children. Daniel 19, sorry, Deuteronomy 19 gives us the principle that if someone is a false witness who testifies falsely against his brother, the Old Testament law specifies that the punishment which he wanted meted out upon the person he lied about, that same punishment should be administered upon the liar. Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto the other party. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. And that's what happened. That was justice. That they deserved what they wanted upon Daniel. And it was given to them. When we refer, though, to the destruction of the families of these wicked men, Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, in the Old Testament law, you were not to put the wife or the children of a man to death for his crimes. Now, God could supersede his own law and order that if he wished, as he did regarding Achan and his family in chapter 7, but ordinarily... You don't execute a wicked man's wife or children for his crime. Verse 24, when it relates the execution of the wives and children of Daniel's enemies, isn't saying that this is justice being administered by King Darius. It's just telling us what happened. It's reporting it. This was also a Medo-Persian custom. That if someone transgressed and annoyed the ruler, the ruler might just have his whole house wiped out. And this was certainly within King Darius's power. He was enraged with these people. He saw what they were trying to do to his court favorite, Daniel. And he was sick of it, and he was going to pay them back. They had made him look stupid. Now he was going to requite them. And one thing's for sure, is that Daniel's enemies among the higher echelons of civil government won't be trying anything like this again. Now all of this obviously raises the question, will God deliver his people like this in Daniel 6, that is miraculously, in our day? Daniel believed and God saved him from the death penalty. Maybe if we are being persecuted for righteousness sake and we believe and maybe if we just pray hard enough or believe firmly enough, God will work an utter wonder so we get off the hook too. Well, think of bishops Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley who were led out to be burned at the stake in Oxford in 1555. There the agent of death was fire, just like Daniel 3. But there was no deliverance for them, and it was the will of God that they became martyrs for Jesus Christ and biblical truth. 
To go back further to the example of Ignatius, now we're going back over 1900 years ago, and he was thrown to the lions in the Colosseum in Rome, like Daniel 6. I picked these examples because they're like Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. And he was an old man at the time, just like Daniel in chapter 6. But there was no miraculous deliverance for Ignatius either. The lions killed him and gnawed his bones. But even in biblical times, God did not miraculously deliver his people. Even in the apostolic age, he didn't always deliver them miraculously. My hunch is that he didn't even usually deliver them miraculously. Sometimes you see a miraculous deliverance, let's say, in the book of Acts. But other times, as with the execution of James in Acts 12, no. A couple of verses from Revelation 2. Here we are in Pergamos. Revelation 2, verse 13. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you. Verse 10, we're now referring to Smyrna in Asia Minor. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Some of you are going to die. And even Hebrews 11 that chapter which says that by faith Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego quenched the violence of fire and Daniel stopped the mouths of lions to quote verses 33 and 34. Go down a couple of verses to verse 36. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder were tempted, were slain with the sword. So in the Old Testament, there were miraculous deliverances. But not only that, other ones suffered shame and death. And the lesson for us in persecution, even if it comes to impending death, as that form of persecution, is not that we should hold out hope that maybe we will miraculously be spared. We may be spared. Let's say there's a good lawyer or the king or the court changes its mind, but we will not be miraculously spared. Instead, the lesson for us is to read a passage like Daniel 6 or Daniel 3 and see the lesson about faith, believing. And out of faith, persevere and receive glory beyond death as revelation 2 puts it be ye faithful unto death and i will give you a crown of life that's the promise that faith goes out to believe that the days of miracles are over there's the miracle of the new birth of course is the miracle of the second coming of Christ. But we're not called and we don't have divine promises for the sort of miraculous deliverance recounted in Daniel chapter 6. Let's move finally and briefly to the royal doxology. Notice with me those who are addressed in Darius's praise. Verse 25. King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom. He's referring here to his whole realm. And remember, we believe that King Darius is given a prominent, large, rich portion under him within Cyrus's Medo-Persian Empire. 
This portion is roughly the fertile crescent of the snow from the coastline of the Persian Gulf up the Euphrates and Tigris into Syria into Phoenicia and then down into Palestine. Universal language, universalistic languages, all people, nations and, la and languages. All the dominions of my kingdom. I'm speaking to you who are under me. And the calling is given in verse 26. In every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Just as Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 talked about the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Fear and tremble, says King Darius. But it's the reasons for this calling that are most impressive. And they build up and become even more powerful as we work our way through them. The first is God's nature. Tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. He's the living God. He lives and he preserved the life of Daniel. And he is steadfast forever. He's always faithful to his people. And he is infinitely more unchangeable than the laws of the Medes and the Persians. He is steadfast forever. God's nature, living, steadfast, eternal. God's kingdom is the second thing that Darius points out. His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. That is, Jehovah's kingdom is indestructible and eternal. In many ways, it's a reflection of himself as the living, steadfast God forever. And not like the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Fear and tremble before the living, steadfast, eternal God with an indestructible and eternal kingdom. All ye citizens of my realm. That's what Darius is saying. And then he moves into God's deliverance. God's nature, God's kingdom, and God's deliverance. He, verse 27 says, He delivereth and rescueth. And he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power, or literally hand, or paw, of the lions. This deliverance of Daniel is called a wonder because the people who hear about it were and are filled with awe, fear and tremble before him. And it's called a sign because the rescuing of Daniel from the lion's den is a sign that Jehovah is the living God, that his kingdom is indestructible and eternal and even we can say, this admittedly in the light of the full biblical revelation, even that God's kingdom embraces wild and carnivorous animals like these lions. Because one day the lion will lie down with the lamb and snakes won't bite you. And bears will be friendly and cuddly one day. Isaiah 11 speaks of this. Isaiah 65, Ezekiel 34, Hosea 2, Job 5. In the covenant of grace and in the new heavens and the new earth. To use the language of our text. God will send his angel and shut the lion's mouths and the bears and the hyenas and the scorpions and the snakes. And so Christ shutting the mouths of the lions in Daniel 6 is not only a wonder that this should happen and it amazed the people in that court and has been amazing adults and children for centuries ever since but it is also a sign of what God will do in Jesus Christ on the last day and in the new creation. We're going to go back to Eden 
because there were no carnivorous animals before the fall. All was peace and fellowship and fun with the animals. Only it'll be far better in the new heavens and the new earth. One last thing now. Does this mean that Darius was converted? No. We have similar theodicies, vindications of God, doxologies from Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 with Belshazzar of a sort in chapter 5, now here with Darius in chapter 6. The point of the passage isn't that these people are converted and they say, oh, God is the God of salvation from sin. You never get that. Or the God of Daniel is the only God in the minds of these people. They're amazed at what God has done. They extol him, but he's sort of joining the pantheon. And he's maybe on that day a little bit higher than the other ones. They never really get it. The idea is here the theodicy. Even the wicked will acknowledge God's kingdom. And even these types of antichrist, when God, as it were, grabs them by the throat and shakes them and says, look at what I've just done, look at these things. They admit that God is in heaven, that his kingdom rules over all. And finally, verse 28, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian, Darius being the king of the fertile crescent under Cyrus the Persian over the whole massive Medo-Persian empire. Notice with me that that last half of verse 28 is very similar to the last part of Daniel 1, verse 21. Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. At the end of chapter 6 and at the end of chapter 1, that Daniel lived all the way to the reign of Cyrus the Great. Chapter 6 is the last chapter of the first half of the book. Remember, it's divided into 1 through 6, the historical sections. 7 through 12, the prophetic visionary section. And Daniel 1 is the first chapter of the first half of the book. And now at the end of this unit, at the end of the first half of Daniel, we have it mentioned, Daniel got all the way, not only through the Babylonian period, but even into the start of the Medo-Persian Empire. And that's where the historical section of this book ends. And this is where we are going to end too. Not just this sermon, but this series. After all, we have had 25 sermons on Daniel 1 through 6. We began this series in the days when we first started hearing bits and pieces about this strange disease, plague, covid 19 it was far off we were thinking it would never likely come here that it'd be all be like all the other diseases of the last 20 years that affected other parts and really wouldn't be any big deal later came the lockdown we were big into daniel one through six and then next week lord willing we can meet together for the first time in several months lord willing and i hope that Daniel 1 through 6 has helped you keep your head and your heart up as you think about this great kingdom of God over all and all the kingdoms of men and politicians and rulers playing tiny little parts for the good of God's church. And maybe, maybe one day, I don't know, we will get back to Daniel 7 through 12. We'll see. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word that light from this book may continue to illumine our way and that Daniel 1 through 6 will have helped us and will help us see thy majesty, the greatness of thy kingdom, a kingdom which is indestructible and everlasting and of which we are willing citizens. Bless us, Lord God, with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ thy love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.